My name is Sriharsh Thomasanuri, and my research was on the computational and experimental design of imprinted polymeric nanoparticles as a novel theranostic solution to detect and neutralize endotoxins. So endotoxins or lipopolysaccharides are molecules that are found on the surface of gram-negative bacterial species, such as E. coli, Salmonella, and P. aeruginosa. And they're known to cause more than half of all cases of sepsis, which is an inflammatory condition that's characterized by the body's excessive immune response to bacterial infection. Now, when lipopolysaccharide enters your bloodstream, it interacts with a protein that's constantly circulating within your blood, known as LPS binding protein, or LBP. The complex that forms between LPS and LBP then goes on to trigger a cell surface receptor known as CD14, which leads to the release of inflammatory molecules such as TLR4s and cytokines. Now, under normal circumstances, this would be considered a healthy immune response. But when LPS concentrations are excessively high, it can lead to excessive inflammation and eventually organ failure. Today, when a sepsis patient enters the ICU, they're given a set of broad-spectrum antibiotics to try and reduce this inflammation. However, with the rise of antibiotic resistance, it's usually necessary to conduct a blood culturing step to target the exact source of their infection. However, this can take several hours and is the reason, which is usually time that most sepsis patients don't have. And it's the reason why sepsis is currently the leading cause of death in US hospitals today. And in developing countries, patients have chances of survival that can be as low as 20%. Now, today, the gold standard for detecting endotoxins is an assay known as the LAL assay, and it uses an enzyme that's actually derived from the blood of horseshoe crabs. Now, in addition to being prohibitively expensive, um, it also leads to inaccurate detection in the presence of certain um, salts and chaotropic agents due to a phenomenon known as low endotoxin recovery. Now, over the years, there have been efforts to um, create recombinant versions of this enzyme or simply extract the endotoxin from uh, the whatever solution it's found in using um, ultrafiltration or chromatography. But each of these processes has been characterized by either um, economic or performance-related drawbacks. So the more ideal solution to mitigate gram-negative sepsis is actually to neutralize the LPS. And most of the research in this area has focused on biomolecular approaches. So using things like PMV protein, which has its own innate toxicity, um, as well as lipid infusion, which has been shown in clinical trials to have very little effect on patient inflammation. So I took a novel and synthetic approach to LPS neutralization by adapting a technology known as molecularly imprinted polymers, or MIPs. MIPs are basically synthetic antibodies, and they're formed by allowing functional monomers to polymerize around a target molecule, which in this case is the LPS, in the presence of a crosslinker. The result is once you remove the template, you're left with a polymer matrix with these specific binding cavities that are selective towards that target. Now, unlike their biomolecular counterparts, MIPs are low cost and robust over a wide range of temperatures and pHs. And the goal of using this MIP was basically to engage in competitive inhibition of this LPS-LBP complex that I mentioned earlier. And by doing this, what you can do is actually reduce the amount of active endotoxin that's circulating within a patient's bloodstream, which has been shown in physiological studies to actually lead to decreased inflammation within the patient. So my objectives with this research were really to optimize the design of this um, polymer to be able to enable applications for both diagnosis and therapeutic purposes for gram-negative sepsis in a more cost-effective manner. Now, one of the main reasons why MIPs aren't seen today everywhere in our healthcare facilities is the fact that it's actually quite a challenge to create these uh, create effective imprints for macromolecules and do it without um, compromising characteristics such as biocompatibility. So to address this issue and sort of streamline my investigation, I started by um, conducting molecular dynamic simulations. So I started with a database of about 67 commonly used functional monomers and screened for cost efficiency and ability to form relatively biocompatible polymers once polymerized. And then um, ended up with 10 that I could actually run complex, uh, detailed molecular dynamic simulations on. So the process basically involved obtaining the coordinate files for each of these um, functional monomers and then generate, uh, generating topologies for them by applying an amber force field to parameterize the type of interactions that would take place and then stabilizing and equilibrating the system consisting of the solvent, the LPS, and the functional monomer and then going ahead to cal um, running a 10,000 time step simulation um, to calculate the free binding energy between each LPS monomer pairing. In a nutshell, what I found was that the hydroxypropyl methacrylate and idaconic acid um, were identified as uh, the two prime candidates for MIP synthesis for endotoxins because of their magnitude of their free binding energies, indicating that they are more likely to react with LPS to form an effective imprint. 
So I then went ahead and translated these computational results to experimental synthesis of these nanoparticles, but using a process known as precipitation and polymerization. So I started by solvating LPS within um, DMF and then uh, allowing functional um, either idoconic acid or hydroxypropyl methacrylate to polymerize in the presence of an ethylene glycol dimethacrylate crosslinker um, within a uh, with fluorocenoacrylate fluorophore, um, and this was all thermally initiated with AIBN, and then polymerized over 24 hours at 60 degrees Celsius. The result is these nanoparticles precipitating out of solution so that I could then collect them and centrifuge them, and then run them through a soxlet extractor so I could remove the template, and the same procedure was repeated for several batches of nanoparticles with varying crosslinker to functional monomer ratios so that I could optimize the composition. Um, and this was also done for a um, two sets of control imprint uh, control polymers that were not imprinted. So they were synthesized using the same process, but without the endotoxin. Um, and then I went ahead and freeze dried them and um, set them up for characterization. So the first step was to actually confirm that my nanoparticles had been synthesized, and I did this using scanning electron microscopy. So you'll find that the distribution of the size is actually pretty high. So it goes anywhere from 50 to 500 nanometers. Um, and my theory here is that um, since LPS is an amphipathic molecule, um, the, there's, it's forming micelles that could be affecting, um, so these LPS ag aggregates could be affecting the size of the nanoparticles that are being formed. Um, but this actually doesn't affect nanoparticle yield because you're able to filter for nanoparticles that are below 200 nanometers in diameter, and those could potentially be applied for things like therapeutics where um, size actually matters, and the larger ones could be applied towards ex vivo diagnostics or um, pharmaceutical solution decontamination. So the next step was to actually look at the diagnostic potential of these nanoparticles, and I did this by conducting fluorescence spectroscopy. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a fluorophore incorporated into the polymer matrix, and um, the reasoning behind this was that we could, uh, we could hopefully establish a relationship between the nanoparticle fluorescence intensity and the concentration of the toxin that these nanoparticles were being exposed to. Um, and so conducting regression, I was able to establish a statistically significant correlation. And this is the first sign, um, basically this is the first method to be able to quantitatively, rapidly um, come up with the LPS concentration. So it has potential for diagnosis within ICUs as well. Um, so the next step was to actually look at the chemical composition of these polymers um, and see what sort of effect uh, the imprinting process was having on the composition. Um, so you'll see here with the hydroxypropyl methacrylate, um, so I was conducting FTIR to do this, um, that there aren't many changes uh, or enhancements in the 2600 to 3600 range. And MIPs rely on a non-covalent binding mechanism. So hydrogen bonding functional groups are extremely important, and you'll see that there's not much of a significant difference um, for HPMA polymers. However, for the idaconic acid, what I noticed what there was that there was a broadening of peaks and there's also an enhancement um, in the alkanil group, which is indicating that there are hydrophobic interactions taking place. And this is really important because lipopolysaccharide is an amphipathic molecule and the toxic portion is actually lipid A. So um, you really need those hydrophobic interactions and this is a sign that those are taking place and therefore the um, polymer is forming an effective imprint. So the final step was to actually look at surface plasmon resonance um, to quantify sort of the binding kinetics and how sensitive these nanoparticles actually were. Um, and this was done basically by immobilizing uh, LPS derived from the uh, O111B14 E. coli strain onto a gold-coated glass slide. And control um, molecules such as IgG antibody and BSA protein, which are some of the most common proteins found in human plasma, were also immobilized. And a... Um, Solution was formed using the nanoparticles, PBS buffer, and tween detergent to simulate the physiological conditions that you would find in plasma. And the solution was flown over at a rate of five microliters per minute um, to look at how the binding was actually occurring. So you'll see here with the white and blue curves, it's immediately obvious that they have a higher magnitude in the intensity of the binding curves, indicating that these nanoparticles are actually specific towards the lipopolysaccharide in comparison with our control groups. Um, and going ahead and actually using resistive pulse measurements to quantify the concentration of the nanoparticle measurement, uh, the nanoparticle solutions, indicated that the um, sensitivity or affinity is on the order of 2.2 picomolar, which is comparable to existing assays such as the LAL assay, which um, uses horseshoe crab blood. 
So um, in summary, chemical, computational, and experimental analyses revealed that molecular imprinting is actually a viable solution for LPS detection and capture, which translates to theranostic capability in the future. And to the best of our knowledge, there's no prior report of applying MIPs as a solution to detect and potentially treat gram-negative sepsis. Now, one of the main advantages of the fact that we're using MIPs rather than biomolecules is the fact that they can actually be stored um, and freeze-dried, and they don't need refrigeration. They can still retain their binding capacity for more than a year. Um, and this enables application in developing countries where sepsis is especially deadly. Um, now, the next steps are really to actually immobilize these nanoparticles onto a um, photonic chip to actually enable rapid diagnosis within ICU-type settings. There's also potential for um, application within pharmaceuticals. Um, Every drug that gets shipped out of a pharmaceutical company has to be tested for endotoxin contamination. So um, there's potential for replacing the LAL assay here as well. Now the ultimate application, um, of course, is for therapeutics and um, combating, the resist, uh, combating the rise of antibiotic resistance. So um, what needs to be done here is basically testing the biocompatibility of these nanoparticles to see whether they are more applicable towards intravenous injection or whether they are more suitable for something like kidney dialysis type filtration systems. And um, I will also be looking at how these nanoparticles respond to different variants of lipopolysaccharides coming from different gram-negative bacterial species as there are slight variations um, that you see in the structure. Um, so I'd like to, so these are my references, and um, I'd like to acknowledge particularly the University of Washington Chemistry Department, um, as well as the Institute for Systems Biology for supporting my work. Um, thank you for listening.